Welcome to Evidence Based, a new Harbinger psychology podcast. I'm your host, Cassie Stossel. On today's episode, we're talking about little t traumas and healing from anxiety. Our guest is Jamie Castillo, author of What Happened to Make You Anxious. Jamie is founder of Find Your Shine Therapy and a licensed clinical social worker specializing in treatment of trauma and anxiety disorders. She is a certified EMDR therapist and EMDRIA approved consultant and has additional training in internal family systems and exposure therapy. She specializes in working with adults experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, phobias, and general anxiety disorder. Hi, Jamie. Thanks so much for joining us on Evidence-Based. Hey, Cassie. Thanks for having me. I wanted to get our conversation started off by asking what a little T trauma is and how do those feed into our anxiety? Yeah. So I think when people hear the word trauma, which has become a buzzword, uh, they think of big T traumatic events. And so those are the typical things that are associated with post-traumatic stress disorder, like serious injury, disasters, life-threatening things. Little T traumas are events that don't typically rise to the level of big T trauma, but they create significant distress and can really impair our functioning. So things like the loss of a relationship, Um, bullying in childhood, having an overly critical or even an emotionally unavailable parent. So you've heard the saying, the little things are the big things. And this really rings true for this concept. It's uh, been documented that ongoing little t events can actually have more uh, or cause more emotional impairment and damage than one single big t event. So the the little definition or the, the the name little t doesn't really do it justice. It's like those little things that compile and stick to you all these years. Yeah, yeah. In your book, you write about how we've all been taught to manage our anxiety wrong. Can you say more about that? Yeah. So every human being is we are in our hardwiring is this need to avoid pain, right? And and we have reflexes that help us do this without even having to think. Like if you touch a hot stove, right? You're gonna pull your hand off faster than you can even think about what's happening. So anxiety is is really no different. It's an uncomfortable experience. A lot of times it's, it can be painful even. Um, and so naturally we we try to get rid of it. And that can look like trying to escape it by numbing it, by sort of checking out or dissociating trying to outrun it, trying to extinguish it somehow. But the problem is that anxiety really is just a messenger. It's trying to tell us something. And when we work to silence it, it just gets louder. It just works harder to try to get that message across. And a small follow-up on that, a lot of anxiety will stem from, you know, something we may be aware of, but what happens when the anxiety really doesn't make any sense? Yes. So typically uh, there, if we do a little bit digging and a little bit of digging in therapy, we can find that there usually is something underlying. And a lot of times it's just not super obvious to us. So for example, like, you know, you might find yourself having a lot of anxiety in a new relationship and you might like have the logic to sort of talk through that by saying like, you know, I don't need to be anxious about this. This person has given me nothing but um, like positive feedback. And so it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But when we really peel back the layers, we might find that, you know, there's some past event where um, you were sort of blindsided and and really rejected by somebody and you thought that relationship was going really well. And so Um, usually it comes from someplace and that's the work we do in therapy is to really uncover that. And what are stuck memories and what role do those play in dealing with uh, anxiety? Yeah. So those are just what I mentioned. So, um, they're sort of like these unprocessed or unresolved experiences from our past that continue to impact the way that we see ourselves or see the world now. So again, if I was, if, you know, if I have a past experience of being really abruptly broken up with in a relationship and I really haven't like worked through that and and the ways in which that impacted me, it might show up in my current relationships as anxiety about being abandoned or being left. What's going on in the brain to make those, those moments stick in there? 
So basically what happens is when a little T trauma like that happens, your brain takes kind of a mental snapshot because it wants to be sure to avoid that painful thing from happening again. So, you know, and and it really generalizes, right? So it might, it might say, okay, relationships are dangerous. You're going to be abandoned. And then in the future, you know, it's sort of like, it's trying to help you, right? It's trying to prevent you from feeling the pain associated with being abandoned, but it's giving these red flags that maybe aren't necessarily logical. And that's why a lot of times people talk about like, logically, I know this to be true, but I'm just still so anxious. I can't get my logic to, to correspond with how I feel. I really relate to that. Like I feel, especially in the work I do, I'm pretty self-aware of everything going on in there, but a lot of the time that self-awareness doesn't equate to not being anxious. Exactly. Exactly. And if it did, nobody would need therapy (laughs) because we're all like pretty smart. We, we can connect the dots, you know, but, and, and that happens with a lot of my clients. They'll say like, I know this thing to be true, but it just doesn't feel true. Yeah, exactly. And in your book, you talk about the fundamental fear. Can you talk about that and how we uncover it and where it might come from? Yeah. So the fundamental fear is really what is at the root of our anxiety. So again, like with social anxiety, for example, most people have the logic to know, like it, they might say it, I know it doesn't matter what people think of me. Like I'm never going to see these people again, or like, I don't even like them that much or, you know, all of the logic is there, but really it's not about I'm fearful of what these people are going to think of me. It goes back to probably um, a fear of being um, inadequate in some way or rejected. And so a fundamental fear is usually um, an I statement. It's something like, um, I'm unlovable. I'm safe. I'm not, I'm sorry, unsafe. Um, I'm not good enough. And it's, it's like the root of, of where our anxiety stems from. Do you find that most people have one or is it possible to have multiple fundamental fears? A lot of my clients can relate to multiple fundamental fears. Um, and you can even have multiple fundamental fears emerge from one single traumatic event. And so in therapy, we would uh, really break that down and see what what the fundamental fears are and then really address them one at a time because um, it it can be really overwhelming to really you know have that information in front of you and think, wow, really I all along I've you know feared that I'm unlovable. And so, Typically, we'll address either the most painful one first or one that um, more recently emerged. And in EMDR therapy, um, Francine Shapiro calls this the first or the worst. So yeah, there's sort of like strategy there. That makes sense. I'm sure it can be overwhelming to, to have to manage all of those fundamental fears and to feel like, how can I overcome all of these when they're presented to you? Yeah. So we just take it one step at a time. And uh, in your work, you talk about a trauma roadmap. Can you talk about, first of all, what that is and how that can help someone start to heal? Yeah. So a trauma roadmap or a trauma timeline is basically a timeline of traumatic events that have happened. And we can also create a timeline of um, really positive events that have happened in your lifetime. And so This exercise can be also overwhelming, you know, because it involves really going through the course of your life and identifying the main traumas that have shaped you. But creating one can also be really therapeutic um, because it it creates this visual representation of the events in your life that have impacted you up until now. And it can really help make sense of other experiences in your life when you can see kind of like the chronological order of the ways in which things happen. So for example, you know, you might know that you had a really rough time in ninth grade um, and you were, you know, sort of acting out and struggling with your grades and 
et cetera. And, and when you write out your traumas, you might realize like, oh, wow, this really significant thing happened just before that. And it probably connects to my behavior, my emotions in some way at that time. Um, so it can really shed some light on on just the way things have gone in your life. And it also provides a roadmap for what we need to address in therapy. So it, um, you know, we can both uh, client and therapist can take a look at that and say, okay, you know, this, this thing that happened when you were six is really the most painful or, or probably the most impactful. Whereas, you know, a couple other things might have not been quite as painful. And, and so that can really guide and inform our treatment. I think for a lot of people, a barrier to, to getting help with this might be the fact that they have to revisit those traumas. Can you talk about the importance of why we have to go back and revisit those in order to manage the anxiety? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question. And I, uh, this is a really important topic, I think. Um, and you know, some people do come to therapy and they'll say like, do I really have to dig up all my past trauma in order to feel better? And, you know, the answer is not always yes. In fact, my answer is always no, we don't have to do anything that people, you know, don't want to do. But I guess it begs the question, like if your attempts to outrun or extinguish your anxiety have been futile thus far, you know, it might be time to address the root of the problem rather than continuing to try to just manage the symptoms. It's kind of like pulling weeds, you know, if you like, I actually just did this in my new house, <laughs> like went through my entire backyard and just like, you know, ripped out the weeds because they were so unsightly. But um, you know, if you don't get like take a shovel and dig up the root, the weed is going to reappear in, you know, next time it rains or you know, in a week, you know, whatever comes first, I guess. And so uh, really, if people have felt like, you know, my coping skills or or the things that I've been doing to try to manage the anxiety on the surface really just are like a Band-Aid, then we might say like, okay, would it be worth trying to go back and see where did your anxiety originate? It comes from somewhere. And if we could help, you know, put some barriers around that event so that it's no longer continuing to affect your life now, um, it may be that you don't have to work so hard to manage your anxiety all the time because we can really, uh, you know, address the root of it. And a totally sidebar question about that. Are you seeing in your practice an uptick of this since the pandemic as being a a trauma that people are dealing with now? Definitely. Yeah, we all have a threshold of stress that we can manage. I, I sort of liken it to like a bucket, right? And we all have like a bucket filled with water let's say. And, you know, we, we've all got a certain amount of stones in it. And when something stressful happens, we like throw another stone in it. And so the water level kind of rises. If my bucket is filled to the very top and I throw one more thing in there, it's going to spill over. Right. And so the pandemic was incredibly stressful for most of us. And it it creates like a a tipping point um, a Mm -hmm. lot of times, because we all have like a finite amount of uh, of stress that we can endure until things really spill over. So yeah, we saw a huge increase in people seeking mental health support in 2021, actually after the pandemic. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I want to talk a little bit about avoidance and what role that plays in anxiety. And also if you could talk about the difference between helpful avoidance and problematic avoidance. Yeah. So we all need to avoid our feelings sometimes, right? Like we can't just, we have lives to live. We have things to do. It's not always conducive to our lives to be like feeling everything that we feel all the time, right? So avoidance should be used as a short-term coping strategy though. So if I do need to avoid, I need to think of it as like, okay, I just need to do something to avoid my anxiety in the short term, and then I'm going to sort of come back to it uh, later, right? So we get into trouble when we try to avoid anxiety in the long term, use that as sort of like a long term strategy, Um, just keep avoiding it, avoiding it, avoiding it. So for example, like, 
if I just really need a break from my anxiety, I might try to distract from it or try to problem solve it by watching, you know, my favorite comedian on TV, right? That might elicit some, some different emotions versus something like, you know, I'm going to start drinking alcohol, for example, to try to like drown out this anxious voice in my head. And that becomes more of like a long-term uh, go-to for eliminating anxiety. I'm sure we're all a little guilty of both types of avoidance. Um, like, yeah, again, because we're all hardwired. We want to avoid mm-hmm. pain. Like, why would we say, oh, yeah, let me feel that really uncomfortable thing. Like, if we can avoid it, why not, right? <laughs> yeah, I would say my worst one in the past three years has been scrolling on TikTok. Like, I oh. was never going to get a TikTok, and then I downloaded it, and now I can't. <laughs> I know know. it's so addicting. Uh, One of our people here at Find Your Shine convinced me to get a TikTok and I'm like, I love you and hate you at the same time. Yeah, it's it's very easy to to dissociate and scroll, but then you also end up adding the problem of wanting to impulse shop on everything you see on TikTok. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a a bad influence in that way. Exactly. (laughs) Um, And going back to little T trauma for a second, I I went to ask you, why do certain distressing memories turn into those little T traumas and some just kind of pass on by without, you know, embedding and getting stuck? Yeah, it's a great question. So it's really all about how we make sense of the experience. So if it causes a disruption in the way that you like fundamentally view yourself or other people or the world, it's likely going to get stuck and cause problems until you address it, right? So just to share a little bit personally, I um, struggled with infertility for many years. And, you know, because I sort of conceptualize that as me being sort of like damaged or defective in some way, it became a traumatic event versus just like, you know, something that happened that um, sort of shaped me. And similarly, like, let's say you get into a car accident, let's say you're driving the car and you've got a friend in the car and you experience the exact same car accident, but to one of you, it might be traumatic and cause problems later and to the other person, it might not be. And, and perhaps it's because, you know, the driver of the car really makes sense of it by saying, you know, this was my fault. I am a bad person. Like I wasn't paying attention. I hurt people, you know, all of those things versus the passenger might've said like, whoa, that was really scary, but I don't like, it didn't fundamentally change my view of myself or the world. And so, you know, those two people might walk away from the exact same experience with completely different experiences of it. That's so interesting that explains something for me personally, a little bit with grief. A lot of my anxiety comes from grief. And sometimes I try to work out like, you know, why this one person's death affected me differently when I feel like I've lost quite a few people, but this one really fundamentally triggers my anxiety year after year. And it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about how two people can experience the one thing so differently and why, why something may be more impactful than others and stick with you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I'm sorry to hear about your experience and it's, it's, you know, it's so important because I hear so many people discounting their trauma. Right. And, and oftentimes the narrative goes, well, other people had it worse Mm -hmm. or have it worse. Right. And it, it really, it's not about this like objective, you know, scale of what's bad and what's not bad. It's the subjective way that we internalize these messages and and the meaning that we take from experiences, which is different for everyone. And so, yeah, it can really, um, th- there's really no place for judgment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we are our own worst critics with this stuff um, when it comes to making sense of our trauma. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like nobody's judging anyone except for ourselves. We're judging ourselves a lot. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. And there's always somebody that has it worse. Everybody can say that. Yeah, always. Earning your continuing education hours doesn't have to be a painful experience. The right course can open your mind to new possibilities, increase your confidence, and hand you powerful tools to transform your clients' lives. 
Praxis Continuing Education and Training teams up with some of the brightest minds in mental health to provide cutting edge, evidence-based training for practitioners. You can learn firsthand from experts like Stephen C. Hayes, Kelly Wilson, Robin Walzer, Kirk Strausel, and many others. Find your next training at praxiscet.com. That's praxiscet.com. And one thing I found in your book that felt interesting to me because it feels counterintuitive, but you talk about befriending your anxiety. Can you talk about what it means to do that and why that might be helpful for someone? Yeah, so definitely is counterintuitive. Befriending anxiety, what I mean by that is really just being able to see your anxiety as an ally rather than, you know, something to loathe right? Um, So your anxiety has a message for you. It's usually trying to help you in some way. And, you know, I think everyone can relate to this concept of anxiety being helpful, right? So like, for example, if you have anxiety about doing well on an important presentation that you have coming up, the anxiety is helpful in that it, it makes, it causes you to prepare, right? Like, if you have a little bit of anxiety, that's a good thing because it means you're going to, you know, prepare ahead of time and do what you can to do well on the presentation. And by contrast, if you didn't have that anxiety, you would probably just like show up the day of and wing it, right? Um, and wouldn't do as well. So so in that case, anxiety is really helpful. And we can, most of us can see that. And the same is true for other kinds of anxiety, so it wants to be sure that you, you know, maintain relationships. It wants to help you stay safe. It just might not have all of the information that you have. In other words, it might be stuck in some past experience um, and be sort of like reliving that experience when you are now in the present, like trying to manage your life and your anxiety. Um, So befriending it is really like um, turning toward it rather than away from it and trying to understand its message. So in the moment, what, what might that look like? Like if I'm triggered and I'm feeling all my anxiety in my body, what are some ways in that moment that I might turn toward it? Yeah. So it depends on kind of what you're doing and, and if you really have the time to, if if it's like a, an opportune experience or time for you to, you know, sort of dig into it and dig deep. Um, But if it was, then what you would do is sort of get quiet, get still within yourself. And, and you're going to think that I sound crazy when I say this, but really go inside and um, try to like feel into your anxiety and really just ask it, like, what are you worried about? And again, like that might seem wild, like to talk to your anxiety, but I promise you when my clients try it and I'll, I'll say to them, like, don't think about the answer. I want you to listen for the answer, right? Those are very different things. Like really feel into your anxiety, ask your anxiety what it's worried about and listen. And you'd be shocked like nine times out of 10 you know, people will say like, whoa, it said this. (laughs) Then they'll look at me like, what are you making me do? Right. (laughs) But yeah, really just having a conversation with it. And in the book, in my book, I go through, um, it's obviously more complicated and it depends on what it says back in terms of what you would do next and, and so on. But yeah, really just, just turning toward it and, and having a conversation. It doesn't sound wild to me at all. It actually sounds like it really makes a lot of sense. Oh, good. (laughs) I'm so glad. (laughs) Another concept you talk about in your book is untethering. Can you say a little bit more about that and how someone might begin to do that? Yeah. So untethering, what I mean by that is really just revisiting a memory um, and processing through it to get it to store properly in your memory. So So the problem with traumatic events is that we see things as being current threats that are really past threats. And so it's like we don't have um, the barriers around the past experience to know with our whole bodies that that thing is over. It's like it's a current threat still. And so untethering the goal is to go back to the memory 
process it through so that it's no longer stored as if it's a current threat. Um, It sort of puts it in its place in history. And that doesn't mean that we forget what happened or even that we're not shaped by it, right? Because we are shaped by our experiences. There's no way around that. But we aren't continuing to go through life seeing through that sort of distorted lens anymore. Yeah, it doesn't have maybe the same power in the current moment anymore. Exactly, exactly. I think a lot of us might have an idea of what our own healing might look like, but can you talk about what what it actually looks like when someone's healing from their trauma? Yeah, this is an important one because I think we often think of healing as like a destination, right? Like I need to be healed. And that is a faulty concept. Like there's no, like this person is now healed and I need to be healed. It's really different for everyone. Sometimes healing might look like just acknowledging that something happened and that it impacted you. Like that may be all that you need to do. Other times it, you know, involves going back to a previous trauma memory and putting it in the past where it belongs It might look like letting go of responsibility for something that was never your fault. The trauma, you know, becomes something that happened to you rather than something that defines you. And, you know, later on in in this like healing journey, it might look like having a little bit of self-compassion or self-acceptance. It's just really important to see healing as sort of this like continuous unfolding process rather than, you know, something that you should really arrive at. And once you've arrived there, you're like in this almighty position, you know, where you never need to to do any more work. I think that thinking about it, like that journey that you just talked about takes a lot of the pressure off somebody as well. Like, I think at least for myself, I'll be like, why am I not over that yet? You know, so I, I like the idea that it's just ongoing. It's just part of your life now, this healing from this thing that happened to you. Yeah, absolutely. It goes back to that judgment, right? And with grief, especially, we get those messages from many other people, right? Like, shouldn't you be over this by now? Um, or like, how much longer are you going to be grieving such and such? And so, you know, that's an example of judgment that we can get from others. But but really, you know, it might be that you will forever be shaped by that experience, you know, and I think that's a really important piece of healing is knowing that it might not ever be the absence of anxiety or grief or any other painful emotion, because to be human is to experience emotions. And you're never not going to be human. (laughs) Um, So yeah, having a little self-compassion in that regard is really important. Definitely. And you mentioned, well, one, we talked about befriending the anxiety and you kind of were alluding to working with that anxiety. Can you talk about some steps to building that working relationship with our anxiety? Yeah. So I think the first thing is just stop trying to outrun it, right? (laughs) Or extinguish it start to communicate with it. So getting in the habit of talking to it, letting go of trying really hard to figure it out logically and like leaning into listening to it. And I like to say, you know, treating it like a friend that you disagree with, but still respect their opinion. So you you might be not be on the same page with your anxiety, but again, like see it as this ally that's this helpful force within you that has the same goal as you. It just has a different um, sort of like roadmap for how it wants you to achieve this goal. So communicating with it and then, you know, kind of coming up with a game plan. And I go in, in depth into this exercise in the book, but, you know, asking it like, what do you need from me? Um, in order to, you know, for you to sort of lighten up a little bit when when we get to this social event that we're really anxious about or whatever. And what do I need from my anxiety in order to, you know, do well at this event or like feel okay at this event? So again, in a nutshell, just sort of like communicating with it is the biggest thing. Absolutely. Uh, one thing that uh, stood out to me when I was reading your book you wrote about anxiety, about not having anxiety. And I thought that was really interesting. Can you say more about that? 
Yeah. So through our experiences, we can develop this sort of like hyper vigilant part of ourselves um, whose job it is, is to be constantly sort of like scanning for danger in the world. And and it can feel like if we aren't constantly anxious, we're going to miss something that could be potentially threatening. So, you know, in doing the work and starting to feel less anxious or or anxious less often, it can bring up that anxiety about not being anxious, right? So, so we might explore it the same way we would explore any other little T trauma. So maybe there was a time in your past when you were really calm, you know, your guard was down and then, um, you know, you were caught off guard by something bad happening. And, and sort of exploring, like, what is it about feeling calm that feels really scary and why? And so, yeah, this is a concept that rings true for a lot of people that I work with. It's sort of like you're grateful that you don't feel as anxious, but then also it like creates this new beast of like, well, I've been anxious all my life. Like, what is it? What am I going to do now that I'm not anxious? Um, so it's a little bit tricky. It's like undefining yourself by your anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Sometimes too, it be, can become like a, yeah, a part of our identity. Um, and to lose that, even if it's like positive change, you know, like change is hard and it creates some, uh, it shakes things up a little bit um, and can cause some, some complicated stuff. So yeah, that's a great point. Definitely. And What are some tools that you recommend for people in the midst of an anxiety attack to help self-soothe themselves? Yeah. So I, uh, think using the five senses is, is my favorite tool, um, because we always have them, right? We always have our sense of smell, sight, touch, hearing all of that. So, you know, if you can, uh, for hearing, for example, you might pull up like some soothing music. Or other like sounds like ASMR or, you know, the shaking of a spray can, like things like that, that feel soothing. To soothe your sense of touch, you might walk barefoot. That's one of my favorites. Um, It's really grounding because it, you know, walking outside barefoot because it, um, you can feel all the different textures, especially walking on grass or um, I know people that even do like barefoot hikes, which it, it really pulls you out of the worry, you know, and the catastrophizing and the anxiety and into the here and now. And then, you know, like, for example, your sense of sight, you might look at soothing pictures or um, like watch YouTube videos of people painting or drawing straight lines. Um, And so you can utilize all five of your senses um, and do things that are soothing to each of them. And then things that really kind of force you to be in the present moment. Because again, we our brains are not good at doing two things at once. And if we try to do two things at once, we might toggle back and forth, but we can't truly do two things at once. So if you're giving your, your brain a task in the here and now, um, it really can't simultaneously be like ruminating about something in the past or worrying about something in the future. I think that's really powerful. I've never thought to try engaging all of my senses my current mechanism is literally just an ice pack on my chest to try to like shock the the anxiety out (laughs) yes yes so there is something very similar to that in dbt skills dialectical behavior therapy it's it's this acronym called the tip skill and it involves um like dunking your head in (laughs) in a bowl of really cold water and holding your breath And, um, you know, people always think like, oh yeah, like, let me just dunk my head (laughs) underwater, you know, like who has time for that? But really it, it, there's like a biological component to it where it activates your parasympathetic nervous system, which is in charge of, um, calming you down, like regulating your emotions. And so when your brain is like, oh my God, I'm freezing, you know, this is why people do cold plunges. I was just going to ask about that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It can't simultaneously be anxious, right? Because you're, it's like trying to survive and and like shocked by this like sensation. So, um, and I think there's some other, you know, science behind it too. But yeah, the cold pack, you intuitively knew that that um, sort of like jolts you out of your anxiety. And there's a reason for that. 
Yeah, that's interesting. But now I want to go walk on some grass when I'm feeling anxious or, you know, listen to some ASMR. So I'll definitely try those. You should totally try it. Yeah. And I think uh, one thing that I feel like has been taken away in the media is the term self-care. I think that has become something really light where it doesn't necessarily mean like a bubble bath or a candle. Like I think self-care can look a lot of you know, different ways, but how can you tell if any form of self-care is actually helping you? Yeah, that's it. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I think, you know, people think that when they hear self-care, they think of like a Frappuccino and a pedicure, right? (laughs) And those things might be forms of self-care. And a lot of times self-care is really like not glamorous and fun and and cute. Like it's it's like painful, but it it really self-care is really any act that preserves or improves your emotional health or your physical health. And the same behavior can be self-care in one situation, but then a form of avoidance in another situation that can be problematic. Um, And it's, so it's all about like, what is this behavior doing for me? And we have to ask ourselves that question, right? So if it, if, if whatever you're doing, if your form of self-care is helping you detach or distract from anxiety in the short term, but actually reinforces it in the long term, it's, it's probably not true self-care. It's um, probably avoidance, right? Problematic avoidance. So for example, like if I am sitting here and I'm super, super anxious and I feel like I can't tolerate it for one more second. And so I go impulsively spend, you know, $500 at Target, which I may or may not have done. (laughs) Relatable. (laughs) (laughs) You know, like the what it's doing for me is helping drown out my feelings because I can't tolerate them in that moment. Right. Um, Versus if I say like, okay, I've prepared for this big presentation. I, you know, there's all this buildup and after I give it, I'm going to treat myself to, you know, buying whatever I want at target. Right. That could be the exact same behavior, in the first instance, it's helping me numb out my anxiety. So it's probably avoidance. And I might call it self-care, right? But it's it's like, am I really being honest with myself about that? Versus like true self-care is often planned ahead of time. It's not impulsive. And it it's it feel it makes you feel good. It feels like a reward. Or it maybe doesn't feel good in the moment, but it, it's conducive to your long-term goals. It's you know, versus the first thing, you know, the target spending long term, you're going to have remorse, right? You're going to feel like, God, I like can't pay off this credit card bill or whatever. So yeah, it's all about asking, what is this really doing for me? And why am I wanting to engage in this behavior? Yeah, I like that makes a lot of sense. And I really like how you explained the the target shopping. (laughs) And Jamie, as we start to wrap up, do you have any advice for someone who's just beginning to heal their relationship with their anxiety? Yeah, I think the most important thing or one of the most important things I would say is that it's normal for it to get worse before it gets better, right? So it's not, everyone's heard, it's sort of like this cliche phrase, healing isn't linear, but it's not like when you start doing this work, you just every day you feel a little bit better and better and better until you've like arrived at healed, right? Doing this work means enduring short-term discomfort for a long-term outcome. So it does get painful. It's sort of like, you know, if you've got like a a wound on your arm and it's scabbed over, doing this work is the equivalent of like ripping open that scab and like pouring rubbing alcohol in it and like cleaning it out, right? It's going to hurt worse in the short term, but it's for the benefit of it healing properly in the long term. And so I would say, don't be discouraged if, if you're like, wow, I'm getting like more anxious or feeling more uncomfortable than I was, you know, before I even started doing this work. And then remembering that healing does not mean an eradication of anxiety, right? So like I said earlier, to be human is to have emotions. um, And those include the painful ones like anxiety. And lastly, you know, even with 10 out of 10 anxiety, I think it's important for people to remember that 
um, you're still worthy of love and acceptance and belonging. Thank you so much, Jamie. I think that's really powerful, really important. I know I got a lot from our conversation and I'm sure our listeners will as well. Thanks so much, Cassie. It was great to be here. In What Happened to Make You Anxious, anxiety expert Jamie Castillo offers a whole new approach, one that focuses less on avoiding or extinguishing anxiety and more toward understanding and working with it to create a fulfilling, meaningful life. You'll learn how your anxiety is connected to what Castillo refers to as little T traumas, seemingly small, unhealed traumas from your past that drive your fear and worry so you can get to the root of your anxiety and start healing. Your anxiety works overtime communicating perceived threats. This book will show you how to listen to anxiety, discern which threats are real, which don't fit the actual facts of the situation, and which are triggered by past events. Once you and your anxiety are on the same page, anxiety will loosen its grip, freeing you up to live with clarity, confidence, and serenity. You've tried managing it on your own. You may have even received treatment. If you're at your wit's end when it comes to your anxiety, this book will show you a new path toward lasting relief. Visit our website at www.newharbinger.com and use coupon code PODCAST25 to receive 25% off your entire order. New Harbinger Publications is an independent, employee-owned publisher of books on psychology, health, spirituality, and personal growth. For 50 years, our evidence-based self-help books and pioneering workbooks have helped readers make positive changes to improve mental health and well-being. Founded by psychologists Matthew McKay and Patrick Fanning, New Harbinger is proud to be an employee-owned company. Our books reflect our core values of integrity, sustainability, compassion, and trust. Written by leaders in the field and recommended by therapists worldwide, New Harbinger books are practical, accessible, and provide real tools for real change. Help your clients achieve lasting emotional balance with the DBT Skills Mega Bundle from New Harbinger Publications. This essential collection offers everything you need to effectively deliver dialectical behavior therapy in your practice, including a set of eight exclusive microskills videos to help improve client motivation in treatment. Visit newharbinger.com for more information. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd love if you rated, reviewed, and subscribed to the show, and we hope you might share it with anyone who might benefit from the content. This podcast is not a substitute for counseling with a licensed provider.